Welcome to this Aslander presentation, Urban Life in the Distant Past, The Prehistory of Energized Crowding, with Michael E. Smith of Arizona State University. Well, um, thanks, Jim. Um, I really like the uh, poster you designed, uh, taking the photograph of Ostia from the cover of my book and posterizing it. It's, it's, uh, I like it a lot. Um, today is Darwin Day. Um, I want to thank uh, Fraser Neiman for reminding me of this a couple of days ago. It's uh, Charles Darwin's birthday, and uh, I don't know what that has to do with my topic, but I don't know. Just thought I'd make a note of it. Um, so I spent most of my career um, excavating Aztec houses in central Mexico. And um, for the last uh, eight or 10 years, directing the Teotihuacan lab in Mexico, and so talking and doing some research, not field work, but research on uh, Teotihuacan. But um, throughout my career, I've had an interest in uh, comparative archaeology, comparing cities, comparing states, comparing different contexts. And uh, this is a book I edited in... Uh, 2012 the cover should say michael smith editor but uh i only wrote one chapter in it um so this book urban life in the distant past cambridge university press it costs a ridiculous about 130 dollars i have nothing to do with that sorry although i just heard today i got an email that they're going to come out with a paperback edition in a couple of months um but this book sort of um synthesizes the past 10 or 15 years of work I've done on cities, urbanism, comparing early cities around the world and uh, comparing early cities to contemporary cities. So um, why compare? Why do we make comparisons? Um, to better understand a given case by comparing it to others, we, we understand the particular case we're working on and uh, to identify new patterns and processes. So we discover things about about the past, about the context we're working on. Uh, but also generalization, um, to generalize about a phenomenon and to distinguish the unique from the universal. Um, so most archeologists use comparison in various ways at various stages of their research. Um, now comparing ancient and modern cities, something I've been working on lately, it seems that the, it, there's some similarities and differences. Um, and here's uh, my list of uh, of the two categories. Uh, human behavior is quite similar wherever you look at it around the world, through time, back through time, and and sociality and the way people interact and and um, a lot of aspects of human society and interaction uh, are similar wherever you look. Um, I also think the effects of population size and density and the role of institutions these affect people in society wherever you look. Um, but of course, there's major differences between ancient and modern cities, uh, energy sources and consumption, transportation, industrialization, capitalist world economy. So if we want to compare ancient and modern cities for some topics, it might be interesting and use useful. And for other topics, it's really you're wasting your time because th there's differences are so great. Um, in this book, um, I spend the first chapter talking about my perspective. It's a scientific perspective, meaning we're investigating, testing ideas, uh, operationalizing concepts, and uh, being as uh, explicit as we can. It's comparative. Um, it's based on social science knowledge. You know, I was trained in anthropological archaeology. And a lot of people think, oh, archaeology is part of anthropology. Well, maybe it is, but I'll tell you, I didn't get much help from anthropology, from cultural anthropology in understanding early cities. Um, so other social sciences contributed quite a bit. My approach is quantitative and interdisciplinary. Um, I, I start in chapter one with five theses, which I nail to the wall. <laughs> Just Luther nailed his theses to the wall. Um, Basically, I set out some of the basic principles, such as these I list here, and uh, make them very explicit. I think it's important to be explicit about uh, one's approach and, and one's biases. Um, perspectives from other fields. Um, 
These are some things I've uh, gotten quite a bit out of from uh, different disciplines. Uh, Robert Sampson is an urban sociologist who's written on Chicago and other cities and and the effect and the way neighborhoods are organized and the neighborhoods are important units within cities. And uh, I've gotten a lot out of this book. Um, Triumph of the City by Edward Glaser. He's probably the leading urban economist today. How our greatest invention makes us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. I was prepared to hate this book. <laughs> it was recommended to me and I thought, man, you know, urban economist, he's just going to be talking about modern cities. It's going to be irrelevant. He's going to say stupid things about ancient cities. Well, he doesn't. He actually has an approach which can be generalized. And um, and although his concern is cities today, his approach to them uh, makes a lot of sense for cities in the past. So I enjoyed this book quite a bit. Um, and Luis Betancourt's uh, introduction to uh, urban science, um, a complexity approach. I don't understand most of the math in the book, uh, but I like his approach to cities. Um, so what is a city? Um, simple definition, a place that concentrates population and activities on the landscape. Uh, many things that uh, we may think are uh, urban-like actually occur in smaller, what are usually called non-urban settlements. For example, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods aren't limited to cities. Some small towns and villages also have neighborhoods. Um, so cities do two things, following from that definition. They concentrate people in space. Uh, and this is the base. This is the uh, the basis for uh, one of the major definitions of cities in the literature, the demographic definition, um, associated with Lewis Worth, a sociologist. Cities are permanent settlements that have high populations, high population density, and uh, social complexity. And so it emphasizes the demographic aspect of cities. But cities also concentrate activities and institutions. And this is sort of the basis of the func the alternative or functional definition of cities, which is um, cities are places where activities and institutions affect a broader hinterland. Um, now, in the book, I have uh, 29 case studies, and each case study takes up, I don't know, page and a half, two pages of the book. And they're done to address specific topics in context of a particular city or cities. And so tonight I'm going to run through, I'm not going to run through 29 case studies, but I'm going to run through a number of my case studies. And uh, the first one is Tikal. Uh, I love this painting by Peter Spire from National Geographic. Um, is Tikal urban or not? Um, in this classic textbook, Mesoamerica, Evolution of a Civilization by uh, Sanders and Price, um, they present this image that uh, compares Teotihuacan and Tikal at the same scale. And they use these this comparison to say, well, Teotihuacan was a city and Tikal was not. Well, why wasn't Tikal a city? Well, there just weren't enough people. Population wasn't large enough and it wasn't dense enough. Um, so it, it Teotihuacan fits the functional definition of urbanism and it fits the defin demographic definition. But Tikal and most uh, just about all the Maya cities they fit the functional definition. They were places on the landscape where people gathered for ceremonies, places where rulers ruled not just the people right there, but people in other settlements. So they were functionally urban, but they weren't demographically urban. Um, now, what does this matter? Well, if you're just analyzing Tikal, in order to analyze Tikal, it doesn't really matter whether you call it urban or not, or what your definition is. But if you want to compare Tikal to Teotihuacan, then um, then the definitions matter. And um, so I would, I don't have any problem calling Tikal or most of the Maya large settlements at cities. Uh, they're functionally urban. Uh, one of my main points is population makes a difference. The number of people and the population density of a place have major effects on what life was like and the way society was organized in cities. Um, this is just a table of all of my um, case studies and uh, where I present the population and the population density and uh, the size of the city. And when I started writing the book, I decided I'm going to have a population 
and an area measurement for all of my case studies, which means I can do a density calculation. Um, now, not all of these had populations in the literature. Um, some of them, so a lot of archaeologists are hesitant. Well, how can we estimate population? We don't really know, and it could have been higher, it could have been lower, and we don't know exactly. There's all these assumptions. Well, you know, there's all these assumptions about everything we want to say archaeologically about the past. And population estimation is no more um, difficult um, or problematic than any other topic we want to talk about in the past. So I said, I'm going to have populations for all of these. So some of these, if there wasn't a population in the literature uh, or an area measurement, I would write to an expert and say, hey, you know, I'm, I want to include this as a case study in my book. I would ask them first, would you read my case study and give me pointers? And also, please, what was the population estimate? And sometimes I'd hear back, well, well, I can't really estimate population. I don't know. I don't want to do that. And I would say, I'm going to put a population in my book for your city. I think the discipline will be better served with a population coming from the expert on the city rather than me. Um, that didn't convert. <laughs> that didn't convince too many people. It convinced a couple. Um, so just to summarize some of the new world cities and old world cities in my uh, among my case studies, I don't want to make too much of this because this is not a sample drawn to make major comparison like this, but the median population is about the same, 13,000 people in cities in the new world and the old world in my book. But the median density, it's twice as high in the old world. In other words, those cities are um, much denser in their population. Um, case study six, the Burning Man Festival. Um, one thing about my approach to urbanism and definition is I can include a lot of settlements that may not be called cities, but really have characteristics of cities. I mean, Burning Man is basically a, a temporary city. It's a city that lasts for you know a week or two in the desert each year. And um, it illustrates something about population. I mean, this was started off as a you know, people having a bonfire on the beach in California and it moved to uh, the desert and increased in population. And it's sort of a, a place based on anarchist principles of no money and people get along and and uh, nobody's in charge and, and people can, you know, party all night if they want, whatever. Um, but there's a very interesting demographic uh, characteristic, which was it grew each year in size and in 1996 when it reached 8,000 people residents temporary residents um chaos broke out uh people started driving cars drunk through the campsites they started shooting guns off and this is federal land and the land managers came and said you get yourself organized or this is going to be the last festival you ever have and almost overnight burning man organized itself as a city there's a department of, what is it, civic architecture or civic planning. And they this whole circular layout, okay, this came about in, in 1996. And, and um, neighborhood organization, uh, basically, there were 8,000 people is too many people to have in a campsite with people just doing whatever the heck they want to do. Um, and so even though it's still based on the, the similar principles that they began with, um, now there are, you know, rules of, of planning and urban layout. Um, I wonder if I can hide this menu. Can you see the whole text at the top of that, Mohenjo Daro? Is that whole thing view visible on your screens? Yes, yeah. it is to me. Yeah, see. Um, it's it's blocked out by by mm. a menu. Hide. Uh, well, I'm not sure how to do. It. I'll just never mind. Anyway, in case uh, Mohenjo Daro. Um, there's the great bath in the foreground. We don't really know what it was for, but it's something that was used for water. And um, it's a very dense early settlement uh, in this valley. Um, And early excavations of a residential zone showed very dense settlement. And one of the things it has is uh, the most advanced um, hydrology and sanitation before the Roman Empire. And uh, there's drains and toilets and showers and baths and, and so on. This is one of the world's earliest toilets here, Mohenjo-Daro. Um, 
so it shows sort of the effect of dense city living and how that can be accommodated um, through a system of civic sanitation. And um, there's also a cool movie. I don't know if you've seen this. It's on Netflix. At least it used to be Mohenjo Daro. So if you wonder what went on in the Great Bath of Mohenjo Daro, this movie will show you. <laughs> um, low density cities. Uh, the Maya are often called low density cities um because the density of Tikal was about six persons per hectare which is quite low and um i just uh i use this is not an official case study in the book but the example of copan here There's been a lot of work on the the center of copan here the ball court and the pyramids and plazas and everything and but that's just really the central uh civic architecture of the site um, the settlement is sort of spread out in uh, in all directions, and the density is uh, is quite is quite low. Um, now, this settlement, this is the place where uh, my wife and I had our honeymoon. We got married in Illinois in a snowstorm, and um, a week later, we're in Copan Ruinas, and uh, we managed to. We were both excavating, and we managed to um, survive uh, most of the time without electricity. Uh, without running water, um, and we're still married 45 years later. Now, the thing that was hardest to survive, though, was the fact that without electricity, the only place in town that had a generator was the movie theater. And they only had one movie for most of the time we were there, which was Saturday Night Fever. And we got so sick of seeing this damn movie. That's the only thing to do, a Copan Ruinas at night. Um, anyway, um, so the Maya illustrate low density cities, cities where most of the residence is really spread out. Um, the Pueblos in the uh, Southwest here illustrate another variation on urban pattern, which is very dense settlements that are small. Um, the density within a Pueblo like this is Pecos Pueblo um, is, is quite high, but it's not a really large settlement. So it has the density, but not the total population. Um, and uh, you can visit Pecos Pueblo and many of the Pueblos today, and uh, and they're really cool archaeological sites. Um, another case study is uh, Chatal Huyuk. Uh, sometimes this is called the earliest city. Um, but oh, check out in that photograph in the background. Check out the car. Look at that black car. Isn't that cool? Uh, it's a James Mill, one of James Millart's uh, photographs that uh, his uh, son let me uh, use in the book. Um, and Chital Huyuk is an agro town. What that is, is a category that was defined in Euro European historians of a settlement that's basically a village of farmers, but it's nucleated. So all the farmers live in town. Um, and the thing about an agro town is it might have a feature like a church or a civic building, but it's only for the people in the town. Right, it's not in the Maya at, at Tikal, the pyramids were not just the people living there. The pyramids were for people in a larger area the whole city-state of tikal um, but in an agro town um you're basically as a village of farmers that's that's uh has a high density highly packed in and so um the as i said these pueblos in the american southwest could be are also probably categorized as uh, agro towns um so i use this just to show the the variation in density from tikal which is a B is a uh, a medieval British town. C is an Aztec uh, town that I excavated. These are all just one hectare pieces, you know, 100 by 100 meters of each of these settlements, uh, Provence. And uh, the Roman city of Ostia, 220 people per hectare. It's just to show the variation in the uh, population density among ancient cities. And for some modern cities, Phoenix here is ridiculously low. It's higher than Tikal, but lower than everything else here. LA is pretty low density. You get to New York City, much higher. Uh, Mumbai or Manhattan, uh, higher density than uh, than uh, Ostia. Um, so I focus in um, much of the book on top-down versus bottom-up processes, institutions versus generative processes. Um, and so institutions are sort of the durable structures that shape urban life, uh, economic institutions, political, social class, and, and so on. So I'm going to start with those and um, 
go through some of the main institutions in early cities. I'm going to skip. Never mind that one. Pretend you didn't see that slide. Case study 10 is uh, Cahokia. Cahokia is often called a chiefdom. Um, it's a, a settlement that's larger, more complex, with uh, bigger architecture than than most of the North American settlements. And uh, uh, Cahokia fits the, the uh, definition of, of just about any definition of urban you might have. Uh, it has urban institutions, central institutions like Monk's Mound or the uh, ceremonial buildings, the temples, the wood henge off on the left side there. Um, and um, this figurine, um, Berger figurine, was found from the BBB motor site close to Cahokia. And this actually was a site um, that I had my field school at. I was at University of Illinois, first first year graduate student. I needed an excavation field school. So I went down to Cahokia and with, with uh, Chuck Barris. And uh, we excavated this site, the BBB motor site. We used random sampling. We put in a bunch of one-by-one -one test pits and found nothing. A couple of storage pits and some sherds. Uh, but the next stage of the project... They brought in the heavy equipment, stripped off the plow zone, and there was a whole village. Our random sampling had just missed all the houses. It's a good <laughs> cautionary tale. I see. If you don't like random sampling, here's here's a story. Uh, and we certainly didn't find this figurine, but it was at the site that we did for our field school. Um, political institutions. Um, two types of empire, direct control and indirect control. This affects the kinds of cities. So the Roman Empire and the Inca Empire were direct controlled and conquer an area and build roads and bridges and aqueducts and you know administer things, bring send out a bunch of bureaucrats and start changing things around. Uh, indirect control is an empire that conquers an area and then basically it's like a mafia protection racket, right? You know, pay your taxes and we'll leave you alone. So it's high taxes, high services versus low taxes, low services. Right. I mean, the Romans and the Incas were Democrats and the Athenians and the Aztecs were Republic. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I try to keep my politics out of my teaching. But but this shows these basic questions of uh, of of uh, political organization uh, characterize both ancient states and uh, contemporary states. Um, so case study 12 is Juanico Pampa. This is one of the cool archaeological sites. I think this is one of the coolest archaeological sites anywhere. Uh, the Incas came and built this as a uh, as a provincial control point um, on on land that wasn't previously occupied. Uh, they brought people in from other part of the empire, um, built the site. People were there, and then Pizarro came with the Spanish conquest, and everybody went home. And so the site was just left there, and then it wasn't destroyed by later colonial occupation. So it was just sitting there, this huge site. Um, and uh, Craig Morris uh, excavated this in the 70s. I was a student at Brandeis University, and Morris was teaching there. I was really interested in early states and early cities, and I never had a course with him. Why? Because he was always down here digging. Um, and uh, one of the things about the, the Inca empire as, as a direct control empire and as a non-commercial economy is, is they made heavy use of storehouses. And you can see some Inca storehouses in a photo. And here's Juan Mapoma's drawing of uh, storehouses. Colca is, uh, is a Quechua for storehouse. And you see the bureaucrat with a quipu. He's keeping track of how many potatoes and how many yamas and so on they have. And the uh, bureaucrat from Cusco comes in there with the big ear spools and um, the local guy looks sort of worried. Maybe he's lost some potatoes or something. <laughs> uh, but the state is running these um, storehouses, and that's something in a direct control empire like the Inca Empire. The state is runs a lot and builds a lot of these features. Um, and of course, the um, part of this uh, state architecture in the in the um, in the provinces is building bridges and the the steep Andean gorges and everything. And of course, uh, you know, you know the bridge from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Well, I mean, the movie takes place in India, but where was the bridge built? The bridge was built in the Andes. They went and got people who are still building these rope bridges to uh, build the bridge for that scene. Um, hey, side 13, Amarna Workers' Compound. Amarna is the big capital that Atnaton built. 
And as as part of this, sort of a little bit outside the main downtown area, they built a company town. Um, basically, these uh, workers' compounds in Egypt were like company towns. They were built by an institution to serve a specific purpose. They kept the workers locked in, isolated, walled, separated from the rest of uh, of society. Um, in fact, Kevin Lynch, urban planner, um, in his book Good City Forum, calls this kind of uh, settlement. Um, he calls it the city as a practical machine, uh, where an institution is building something for, for practical reasons. And another example of these is uh, uh, these fortresses built in uh, in Denmark, Viking fortresses, by King Harold Bluetooth, right? Have you ever seen this guy? We may not have seen this guy, but you've seen his glyph, right? You used his technology. He invented Bluetooth. No, he didn't invent it. When they invented Bluetooth technology, a consortium of companies in Northern Europe, they named it after this guy, Harold Bluetooth. But he built these settlements as special purpose urban settlements to serve a particular purpose in his kingdom. Um, and to continue with the Vikings, um, this book actually originated in Denmark. So I'm Viking stuff is cool. So I put a few Viking cases in the book. Um, thing sites, the Viking thing was a uh, an assembly that the Vikings would assemble together once a year they would hear legal cases, they would make decisions, they'd have a big party, and, and it was called a thing. And um, this is a, a painting of a thing, but it's painting of a thing from this site called uh, Gamla Uppsala in Sweden. Um, so where the arrow is, that's the, the thing mound, which is the mound there where all those people are sitting while they're watching, I don't know, whatever uh, law case is going on down below. And actually, if you notice in the painting, there's like a a building in the background, which is one of the earliest Christian church in this area. And you can see that in the background of the uh, photograph too. So if you're ever in Sweden, um, go up to Uppsala and go to Gamla Uppsala. It's a quite cool site. Um, these are some other uh, thing sites uh, around Sweden. They sometimes have these ship burials, ship settings, and some mounds and some graves and rune stones. Okay, let's move on to economic institutions. Um, the probably the most important variation among ancient states is between commercial versus command economies. Um, and command economies is where the state controls most of the economy. Uh, the term actually was first used for the Soviet economy in the mid 20th century, but it, it works well for uh, for early states, strong bureaucratic organization, and the main examples in the past are the Egypt, Inca, and the Bronze Age uh, Aegean palace economies. Um, so these uh, these states didn't have merchants and money and markets and so on. The state ran things like those Inca storehouses, like those Inca bureaucrats. And uh, here's the uh, the king rule of things in Egypt, Yul Brenner as uh, as Ramses. Um, so case study seventeen is Knossos, the um, the Bronze Age palace on Crete. And um, what you can see in the palace is these uh, on the west side there are these um, long, narrow rooms that are full of storage jars. And so this is this is part of the command economy. It's like this the the state and the palace is is running the economy, so they have to store a lot of goods. Um uh, um, another Viking example, Reba. Reba is uh, an emporium, a trade site on the west coast of uh, of Denmark, um, where trade got going in the 8th century, and just all kinds of fancy goods from all over sort of Europe and the Mediterranean passed through here. And it's been the scene of, exca of excavations lately using sort of high-definition archaeology, where they're using lots of methods, lots of uh, sophisticated techniques. So for here, here's a, a geoarchaeologist taking uh, taking soil samples um, and okay, this is the, this is the former queen of Denmark. I know the the former queen is, a, is an, was an archaeologist when she was younger. There she is digging at the lower picture. Uh, I was looking for a photo of her at Reba because I know she's visited the site of Reba. Um, 
Uh, she's no longer queen, right? She abdicated a couple of weeks ago, uh, but she but uh, she was an archaeologist, and um, the Danish connection for me um, began here at uh, Aarhus University. Aarhus is the second largest city in Denmark after Copenhagen, major university there, and uh, they have a research center, Urbnet, Center for Urban Network Evolution. And um, there's the city of Aarhus and the canal. And then the, the other photograph is a um, it's it's a former fancy manor. And the outbuildings and barns are now the archaeology program at Aarhus University. And so Urbnet is located in that building on the right. Um, it's just south of Aarhus and Mosgard. And if you ever if you're in Denmark, go up to Aarhus and visit Mosgard. The archaeology museum there is one of the best archaeology museums in the world. It's incredible. Um, and I was asked, Urbnet um, invites archaeologists working on urban contexts to come stay in residence for a while and invites them to write a book. So I was asked, will you come stay here for a few months and give some lectures and write a book? And I was just at that point thinking, gosh, I'd like to write an urban book. And I thought, well, it's a good opportunity. So I went there and our wife came over and we were there for four months. I got several chapters written, got the book organized, gave a series of lectures and um, and the rest is history. But, you know, one of the places, interesting story, one of the places they get uh, research money um, comes from Carlsberg Beer. The guy who founded the Carlsberg Brewery was into the classics. He had a um, a Roman villa brought in from Southern Europe and reconstructed in Copenhagen, where he lived. It's got you know mosaics and everything. And when he passed away, he left the uh, the whole brewery to the Danish Royal Society. And so when people when you drink a Carlsberg beer in Denmark, the profits to that go to supporting scientific research. And Urbnet has, you know, a good deal of their funding comes from the Carlsberg Foundation. And so you can feel good about drinking beer in Denmark. Um, Case study 21 roads. I knew absolutely zip about this settlement when I started. Um, but it, I was looking for a case that showed very strongly a commercial economy and a very strong commercial economy. And I found, um, I was given, a, I had a couple of RAs work for me at Urbnet and one of them had uh, worked on Rhodes and suggested this. And um, Rhodes was the leading uh, maritime uh, power sort of after the fall of Athens before the uh, before the development of, uh, of Rome and major shipping. And here's a ship launch uh, ramp at Rhodes. And in this photograph, Rhodes sent a lot of wine to various places around the Mediterranean, including Alexandria, what's now Egypt. And it turns out that more than 100,000 amphora seals, they're marked with a seal indicating that they're from Rhodes, more than 100,000 of them have been excavated in Alexandria. Can you imagine that? That is just incredible. This is an archaeology lab in Alexandria. And the whole table is full of nothing but amphora seals from Rhodes. I mean, that is trade. You know, we think we have a lot of trade going on in the Aztec Empire. It's nothing compared to these uh, ancient Mediterranean trade. Really incredible. Um, so scale of ancient economy, sort of a scale of commercialization. The bottom is the least commercialized. Uh, Pharaonic Egypt or the Inca would be down here. They, yeah, they have imports, but they don't really have entrepreneurial merchants or money. Aztec is more commercial, Swahili, classical Roman medieval sort of at the top. And the level of commercialization um, affects the nature of cities and, and the way urban life takes place. Um, shops, just one example. Uh, shops only exist in commercial economies. Uh, Olynthus and Ur, excavated by Leonard Woolley, and various sites. Shops are, you know, little... Um, rooms that open onto the street and often open into the house. Um, but you don't get those in non-commercial economies. The Egyptian and in the Andes, Teotihuacan, um, if there were shops there, there would be rooms in these apartment compounds that opened onto the outside. And they just, there aren't. Um, other institutions, um, social class, um, 
social class as inequality has been institutionalized, persistent, and uh, and pervasive. And just to give you one idea, um, what I did here is I took a number of sites in Mesoamerica, Valley for comparison, took the size of the commoner house, and in the middle column, commoner house called that one. And I said, how many times bigger is a noble house or the palace of a king or whatever? So look at the two red cases. At, at uh, Tenochtitlan, a noble house is 92 times as large as a commoner house. The emperor, the emperor of the Aztec empire was 980 times as big as a commoner house. Um, at Teotihuacan, however, even though commoner houses were bigger, noble houses were only four times as big. So this gives us information about the class structure. Um, and at Yautepec, um, site that I've excavated and talked about in, uh, in these lectures here, uh, we have large houses that were from the nobility and smaller houses from the commoners. Um, and this is some of the sizes of the houses. The elite residences were higher in their construction volume. And this is a comparison of a uh, elite house versus a commoner house, elite compound versus a commoner house. Um, and our kids were closely involved in, in the local community. We were involved in the local community. Here's a, a daughter, Heather, with her pals, and, and it was Wear Red Day at day camp. Can you spot the green guy in here? Um, okay, so that was institutions. I'm going to go through generative processes. This is uh, people acting individually, um, but not sort of under the control of a leader or an institution or a government. Um, and so when people aggregate in cities, what happens? And uh, this is people do things in cities on their own. They're not under the control of the authorities. And whether it's buying a hot dog or watching a ball game or, or whatever, or uh, getting arrested or uh, sitting around and talking and uh, whatever, um, lots of kinds of activities take place in cities and they have consequences. Um, and when you have high populations and high population density, it produces what uh, is called energized crowding. That term comes from uh, architectural historian Spiro Kostov. Um, and energized crowding has several effects, it has negative effects called scalar stress crime, poverty, and so on, uh, comes from too many people, too dense population. Community formation happens. People in a city, they don't want to live their life on a scale of you know 100,000 people. They want to live their life on a smaller scale, and that leads to neighborhoods. Um, sometimes neighborhoods are, are built from the beginning um, by the authorities, by the builders or planners. Sometimes neighborhoods just develop and as a generative process by people's actions. And a third, a third outcome of energized crowding is economic expansion. And one way that we measured this is through settlement scaling research. So I'm gonna make a try, try to go through this stuff quickly and hope it doesn't sound like too much of a mess. Um, settlement scaling developed at the Santa Fe Institute, right, a think tank in the, the, the sciences of complexity Jeffrey West, physicist, uh, Luis Betancourt, also a physicist there, and Jose Lobo, who's an, uh, an economist and complexity scientist and uh, my colleague here at Arizona State University, um, worked on how the quantitative outcomes of population processes in cities lead to certain sort of uh, regularities in what happens in the city. So, People in a city move around for various purposes, um, and they build this model based on the fact that movement has a cost, so it's easier to interact with people who are closer to you than people who are farther away. Um, assumption number two, social interactions have positive economic outcomes. Uh, when, when people meet, they learn things from others, and it helps them in their activity and leads to... Um, leads to sort of increased output for all people concerned. 
Uh, and these are generative processes. This isn't the the authorities telling people what to do. This is what happens by people just living their lives and doing their thing in cities. Um, so people interact in cities and it ends up with quantitative regularities. Um, and these regularities, this is called superlinear scaling. The population on the bottom and the gross domestic product uh, on the vertical axis. And the black line would be if doubling the size of a city led to doubling the gross domestic product of the city. Um, but the thing is that the actual data are above the diagonal line. In other words, super linear scaling. Uh, what it means is within a given system of cities, say U.S. cities today, if a city is twice as big as another city, it will have more than twice gross domestic product. And uh, so social and economic measures increase more rapidly than the population size. Um, so many things scale with population this way. GDP, income, patents, negative things too. Crime, poverty, disease. When a city is twice as big as another city, it has more than twice as many uh, or twice the level of all of these things, including rock bands. Okay, there's a database on how many rock bands there are in different cities. I think this is a Canadian database, I think. And if a city is twice as big as another one, you'd expect it to have twice as many rock bands? No, there's more than twice as many rock bands. There's something about cities that's generating this super linear scaling. And yes, there's only one Grateful Dead, but... Um... So Luis Betancourt published this paper in 2013 where he took those regularities and generated a quantitative model that explains them. Um, and the model is based on the cost of movement in the city and interactions have economic benefits. And I'll let you look at that for a while. We'll have a quiz at the end of the talk and uh, I'll ask you to <laughs> plug it in the... <laughs> no, I couldn't do that either. Um, it's actually not very complicated. It's just, it's algebra. And um, the point is that um, Luis Bencourt worked out this model that actually predicts the features of modern cities rather precisely. So Scott Ortman, archeologist, uh, University of Colorado, was a uh, postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, so I thought, hey, you know, this might work for ancient cities too. There's nothing about the scaling model that's limited to the modern economy. It's not based on wage labor or industrialization or the capitalist economy or any of that stuff. It's based on how people interact within cities. I thought, well, let's, can we do this archeologically? And Scott um, applied it first to data from the from the Valley of Mexico here. And if you'll notice that one part of the Valley of Mexico where the circle is, I found those sites. Me, I, well, I was the undergrad on the survey team that we located and recorded those sites. That was my first, uh, first uh, time in Mexico, 1974, working with the William Sanders survey on that was the part of the survey zone that uh, I worked on. Anyway, because those data were gathered well and they were published and they were put into a database, Scott, who was able to use those data and investigate scaling and found what we call sublinear scaling. Um, sublinear scaling is when the quantity increases slower than population. In other words, a city that's twice as big as another city does not have twice the area. It generally has less than twice the area. That's called sublinear scaling. And the, the exponents are not over one. The exponents are under one, 0.726 here. What this means is that larger cities are denser than smaller cities because the population increases twice as much. The area increases less than twice as much. Therefore, people are concentrated in a smaller area. Big cities are denser than small cities. And this sublinear scaling is sort of a, is just the mathematical way of, of showing that the big cities are denser than the smaller cities. And he, Scott found this. And so we set up a project called the Social Reactors Project. The idea is human settlements are social reactors that people interact and they generate um, outcomes and, uh, and we can measure those outcomes in modern cities and in ancient cities. So it was um, Luis, Jose, Scott, and me. 
And uh, if you go to this website, you look at Social Reactors Project of Colorado, um, you'll find our publications. So here's an example um, that we did with, uh, with my student, Rudy Cesaretti, uh, 14th century European towns. This was not archeological data. This was our first test case though. Um, measure the area of the city, measure the population. And what we should get, we had a, we had a good sample of, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred 14th century cities. So it's sort of amazing that there's that much data available. Um, Sublinear scaling for each area. In other words, um, the black lines are the um, are the lines where the scaling exponent is one, that the area would increase at the same rate as the population. But all of these cities are along lines that are below that. Their slope is 0.7 something or 0.8. Uh, what does this show? Large medieval cities are denser than small settlements in the same way that contemporary cities are denser than smaller settlements. Um, and this summarizes a bunch of the case studies that we uh, that we did. This this band between the da dashed lines is the theoretical prediction for sublinear scaling of area with population. And most of our cases are right there, either right in that band or right outside it. Uh, it's really quite remarkable that we get these results for so many cases. Of course, the Maya up here are up here. Maya are weird. You know, the Maya are doing something different. Those low density cities are different. And I don't have time to explain it now, but we actually figured out a way to make sense out of the Maya cities. I published that a couple of years ago. Um, so what does this all mean? Um, generative processes like energized crowding are important. They have measurable outcomes. And for energized crowding, ancient cities work very much like modern cities. Um, so we're dealing with these similarities in human behavior and sociality. Um, so one other quick topic I want to review before I finish up is how do modern cities compare to ancient cities? I love this graphic. Uh, Scott Ortman, someone do this at University of Colorado. It's cool. Um, how would ancient cities be useful for understanding cities today? Well, there's three kinds of argument. One is urban trajectory argument, right? If we look at the past, the farther back we look, the farther ahead we can see whether Winston Churchill or Sandra Day O'Connor. Of course, there's always someone like Henry Ford to say history is bunk. But uh, the idea is we have the um, archaeologists have a record of cities over thousands of years. And so we can see how urban processes played out over long periods of time and may, that might help understand urban dynamics today you know and and uh, this is what happens to some cities and other cities have survived um second argument is sample size argument so looking at ancient cities gives scholars and planners and policymakers a broader range of cities to compare things to and for making generalizations. It just widens the sample of known cities. Um, the third argument is the laboratory argument. And this is not a laboratory thing. It's a fake thing. Uh, and ancient cities can use to be test hypotheses about urbanism. And that's what this, so that's what the um, urban scaling modeling is about. We're taking hypotheses based on um, modeling of modern cities. And there's very precise quantitative hypotheses, and we're applying them to settlement pattern data and urban data from the past to see whether the ancient cities are similar or different from the modern cities. So I'll leave you with some energized crowding. Um, I've had several beers, this cafe in Aarhus on the left. You know, it's funny, I will go there with a friend or a colleague and and uh, they, they're they Danish. Oh, the sun is out. We need to sit in the sun. And I'm from Arizona. I think, oh, my God, we can't sit in the sun. We have to sit in the shade. Um, the one on the right is a certain kind of energized crowding at Aarhus University. It's a uh, competition they have each year that involves drinking lots of beer and riding in kayaks and doing silly things. <laughs> and um, But energized crowding works out, has similar effects wherever you are. So at the bottom, we have a, a Pueblo and the energized crowding in the southwestern U.S. Pueblos produces outcomes that are broadly parallel to many other society. So um, my book will be coming out in paperback in a couple of months. And um, 
and I hope it doesn't cost too much. <laughs> and thank you very much. I can take some questions, I guess. Oh, that was great, Michael. Um, <clears throat> I do have uh, one question here from Rob. But first, anybody else who wants to uh, put a question in the chat feature, please do. But Rob wants to know, is there a correlation of urbanization to the development of writing systems? Oh, well, um, most, most early writing systems developed approximately the time that early cities developed. But it's not a one-to-one, -one, it's not a determinative relationship because, I mean, in the Andes, the Incas and the pre-Inca groups did not have writing, but they certainly had cities. Um, so it's not determinative, but they tended to occur together in, in world history, yeah. And then, Gail, uh, at one point you must have shown some images and she asked, was there a location in which the noble house was smaller than the commoner house? Maybe. <laughs> uh, sorry if I went too fast. Um, well, no. I showed some some plans at Yautepec, and the noble house was uh, was quite a bit larger. The commoner houses were smaller. Um, Teotihuacan's a weird case because at Teotihuacan, the noble compounds are smaller than the commoner compounds. And the reason is they have fewer family units. The family units in the noble compounds at Teotihuacan are much larger than the family units in the commoner compounds. So that's a case where that seems a little odd unless you look at the structure of the residence. But actually, you know, it's a pretty, pretty strong cross-cultural relationship between house size and wealth. Um, and and that's what we're sort of relying on in in the superlinear scaling archaeologically is that um, house size is a measure of household wealth, and that allows us to sort of quantify wealth compared to population. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Brenda in in Chicago want to know <clears throat> if any lidar was used, or if it was used, would the stats be affected? Ah, well, let's see. I didn't really talk about LIDAR cases. It's been applied pretty heavily uh, in the Maya area. And um, in spite of things you've probably read, how it's revolutionizing archaeology, I'd say nothing of the sort. Um, LIDAR has the potential to really improve our understanding of settlement and population and urbanism but it hasn't come anywhere near doing that yet because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to process that data and to turn it into usable information um, where you actually know, well, how many house mounds were there and what was their distribution and, and how many civic buildings. And, and so LIDAR has the potential to really increase our knowledge of Maya settlements and urbanism, but it really it hasn't done that yet. Uh, mainly what it's done so far is, oh, nice maps of settlement. Isn't that cool? Uh, which is nice, but it's in terms of a scientific understanding, it needs a lot more analysis. And I know you mentioned Tikal, but uh, <clears throat> Ken Drude would like to know what's unique about the Maya cities? Um, well, um one feature, it's not absolutely unique, but just th their low density, the fact that you have these these towering pyramids and a lot of architecture that required quite a bit of labor to build, and then the people were really spread out over a large area. Um, and um, that's an unusual characteristic. Um, the Maya, the, the use of Maya writing system and and uh, and long count dates is really helpful for scholars today for uh, understanding some of the activities at the site and and dating active dating the uh, the occupations. Um, you know, the, people compared the Maya to Angkor, but uh, this Angkor was a much bigger city than any of the Maya cities, it, but settlement was pretty low density. Uh, as in the Maya area, and you do have these, you know, big stone temples, and then people living in more perishable buildings spread out through the, through the jungle. 
Mm -hmm. And Elaine <clears throat> asks, could you expand more on the concept of energized crowding? Is it the same as economies of scale or agglomeration? Well, energized crowding is sort of, you know, it's it's sort of what happens when the population and or the density of a settlement go up. And so that leads to more interactions um, and it leads to a certain buzz. Cities have stuff going on. And that's, you know, when you go into a, a city and it's a different place from going into a, a village and that that feeling of activity um, and lots of people and things happening. And um, that's that's sort of what energized crowding is. Um Economies of scale is, I think, a little, a little bit different. And agglomeration is, it, well, it's it's related. Um, what the scaling analysis, actually, the results are showing is that what are called agglomeration effects. And agglomeration effects in, in economics is when workers and firms concentrate in a particular place, um, that has economic effects on growth and economic activity. And so the fact that you get super linear scaling from when modern or ancient settlements is, is a kind of evidence for agglomeration effects. So I guess you could say that energized crowding is one of the components that creates these agglomeration effects. All right. And uh, Marilyn... Uh, living up on some unceded land in uh, Canada, asked, would it work to apply your analysis to a current city in the U.S. in order to determine why population is declining? Well, see, here we get into when I had the comparison of, of similarities and differences between modern and ancient cities. Um, among, the, I think, the differences in their, their economic context and the economic role of cities is one of the big differences. And and decline in, you know, decline the Rust Belt cities and, and Detroit or Buffalo, New York, declining in population. I mean, that's based on the 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 modern economy. And ancient economies just work differently. I don't know if there's any cases of of economic decline like that. I mean as a generalization, ancient cities were sort of more political than economic uh, things in that. Uh, so the Roman Empire leaves Britain and urbanism basically disappears almost entirely. And then it grows up again in the Anglo-Saxon period. But it's because of the political withdrawal of Rome. Um, you know, when, when the Inca Empire falls apart, uh, that's when Monaco Pampa comes to an end because everybody goes home and 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 these political developments um in in ancient cities lead to cities uh growing or declining um and today a lot of the the growth and decline of cities is more an economic phenomenon based on the, the modern economy hmm. well gill comments that uh Thank you very much. Uh, great lecture. And he looks forward to reading your book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, then Powell's on Twitter, but I've never met him. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Hernando would like to know why very dense settlements did not turn Segon Vitieron in, into cities. Yeah, yeah. Ah, good question. Um, Justin Jennings, archaeologist at the Royal Ontario Museum, works in the Andes. Justin Jennings, in his book, Killing Civilization, has an interpretation of early cities that I really like. He says that cities developed before state-level society. Cities developed before the complexities of states and governments and rulers. And that when and that cities, because of the growing populations and the issues in handling a large population, that in some cases cities just sort of 
broke down, things broke down, and you don't end up with a state. People didn't want to have a state society. They didn't want rulers telling them what to do. And um, and they wouldn't put up with it. And so some of the early settlements, and and uh, Jennings uses Chautauquayuk as one of his early examples, don't turn into large cities. They don't develop state-level societies. In other cases, institutions were were developed to handle the complexities and the problems of urban life. And that's when you get like Tiwanaku or Teotihuacan and Monte Alban, where you get early cities that developed into state level societies and empires. So something like Chateau Huyuk, I, I don't, you know, the, would they have institutions like social classes and rulership? I don't think people would have put up with that. That's, uh, and I sort of agree with Jennings on that, that matter. Hmm. And Elaine would like to know, could you tell us your opinion on the relationship between pre-industrial cities and their hinterlands? Well, um, they needed to have a pretty good relationship because people needed to eat. That's one of the big differences, right? We can food supply. You know, today we can get food from all over the world. And, uh, you know, I'm living here in the Arizona desert. And, you know, some things are grown around here because we have irrigation uh, but a lot of the food is brought in from elsewhere. And we can do that. I can get food from Africa, food from China, food from wherever. Um, and in the ancient world, you couldn't do that. You had to get the food nearby. Transport costs were high and, you know, we, we didn't have the ability to preserve or food real well. And um, so cities were very dependent on their hinterlands. And um, and so that's an absolute crucial thing. And I, we would, what would be a big help in understanding ancient cities is if we had more research on the hinterlands, if we had more research on the places outside of cities where they grew the food. I mean, where'd the labor come from to build those pyramids at uh, Maya sites? You know, it came from their hinterlands. Um, and so that's it's a crucial relationship. Hmm. And Jonathan would like to know, was there some top down rules or norms in the Maya cities causing the low density? Like working against the natural economy of city growth, just densification, yeah. like some kind of ancient zoning equivalent? Well, um, first of all, it would be real hard to document that. Maya <laughs> writing didn't talk about any of these things, right? Maya writing was about kings and rituals and all. Um, but I think that's very unlikely. Um, I don't... I, just that... Where you do get zoning is a very modern phenomenon, and um, and it's just I don't I don't know of any pre-modern case, you know, or where we have evidence. I don't know medieval Rome, whatever. Any pre-modern <laughs> case of uh, of of sort of the zoning or its equivalent of of rules instituting well this needs to be denser or not as dense or something. But I don't know. Now you got me thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Bill Frege would like to know, hey, Bill, glad you're here tonight. Any lessons learned from the demise of the ancestral Puebloan cliff dwellers in the 1300s and the cities today? I saw oh. one study or you mentioned data from uh, Mesa Verde. Um. Well, I'm gonna bow out of that one. I don't. I'm not an expert on the Southwest, and um, the the thing. I, one of the things I like about Southwestern archaeology, though, is that the chronologies are very refined. There's been a lot of field work. Preservation tends to be good, and so we know a lot about those societies. And I think a lot of aspects of Southwestern societies are relevant for understanding urbanization. Uh, but that said. I don't know too much about the um, the decline in the 1300s, and uh, yeah. So Bill Frey. So we have um, we have a project together that's going to be coming out before too long. He's got a cool book on uh, early cities, and I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be giving away the thing. And I'm writing an essay for it, and uh, we're having fun doing that. <laughs> but I'm gonna bow. I'm gonna duck that one. <laughs> I think that's what I was thinking of when I mentioned somebody said you wrote the uh, preface of their book or something. 
Ah, okay. Yeah. Because uh, he had, uh, now I'm remembering he had mentioned that to me. Yeah. Yeah. And Gail would like to know where on the timelines would establishments of centers of learning be? Um, well, um, it's hard to, it's hard to establish archaeologically. Um, and where we have writing, we have sort of equivalent of educational institutions, I think, in, um, in a number of the early states, in Angkor, in China, um, Mesopotamia, perhaps associated with the temples. Um, and but, but it's hard. I mean, in Mesoamerica, we have written documentation of the Kalmykok, which was a kind of school from the Aztecs. But how far back did that go? We don't really know. Um, Kali Slovaka, which is the site I excavated, has a building that the excavator called a Kalmykok. So now it's in all the guidebooks. Oh, there's a Kalmykok. There's a school there at Kali Slovaka. Well, guess what? It's a royal palace. It's not a school. Um, but um, that's, I don't know, for, for early cities, we know a lot less about um schools and educational facilities than than many other things so and then elaine's saying you stated that teo did not have signs of market economy because there were no storefronts perhaps you must have understood yeah. but is it possible that they laid out their goods on the avenue of the dead um yeah, you know, whenever I, you know, show that slide of Teo and with the non-commercial cases, I worry someone's going to speak up and go, yeah, but what about the markets? Didn't they have markets there? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, most people think there was a market at Teo. Oh, yeah. um, there's a big open compound across from the Sio de Dela that um, most people interpret as a marketplace. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, if you put Teotihuacan on that scale of commercialization, it would be lower than the Aztecs, but higher than Egypt. Um, so they probably had markets, but there's nothing that looks like shops. So, um, you know, those examples that did have shops are are all um, sort of higher up on the commercialization scale, Greece and, and uh, Sumerian. Okay. Well, the questions have dwindled down. Does anybody uh, want to unmute and make a comment? I don't see anybody unmuting. Hmm. Well, you want to call it at that? Okay. Well, thank you. Those were... Um... Looking forward to the paperback. Me too. <laughs> um, those are good questions. That was excellent questions. This is a good audience. All right. So I I enjoyed I enjoyed this and the previous talk I gave and um... wonderful. <clears throat> and we'll get a lot of mileage out of the recording. And if you're in my Aslander uh, email list, I'll probably post it in a few days. And uh, you'll get to notice you can listen to it with your morning copy or whatever you want to do and bill says a wonderful talk <laughs> all right with that everybody thank you for attending tonight thanks a lot folks hi gail <laughs> thanks for watching this outslander program and please subscribe to our youtube channel to subscribe to free monthly issues of the At Slander Magazine of the Americas, contact your host, Jim Reed, at myaman at bellsouth.net. See you again soon. Mm -hmm.